Okay, I think we're gonna kick off here. Thanks everyone for joining us on this panel, um, online shopping. So um, I guess the exciting stuff happening today that will be the antitrust enforcement fights of tomorrow. Um, my name is Clint Rainey. I'm a journalist uh, who's covered food and agriculture for nearly a decade. I'm a contributing writer for Business Week and Fast Company and a few other places. Um, my focus is, is largely um, holding corporations accountable. So this fits in the middle house pretty well, I guess. Um, I'm gonna be the moderator for the panel and then we have um, two presentations by three very smart uh, thinkers here. And I guess I'll just do some quick bios on them starting down there at the end. Uh, we have Sean O'Brien. Uh, Sean is a lecturer at Yale Law School and the uh, Chief Security Officer at Panquake. He's a visiting fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School, where he founded and leads the Privacy Lab Initiative. Uh, Sean's also an editor for Talk Liberation and was the head tutor for the founding cohort of Oxford Cybersecurity for Business Leaders. His paper is called Privacy Analysis of Apps and Beacons in Food Retail. Then we have um, this duo here or we'll be presenting together. Um, we have uh, sorry, I lost my page here. Uh, we have we have Bruno Renzetti. Uh, Bruno is an LLM candidate and a PhD candidate at Yale Law School and at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, Bruno, uh, prior to attending Yale, was an associate at a law firm in Sao Paulo where he worked on antitrust cases before the Brazilian Council for Economic Defense. He's also a professor at two other universities in Sao Paulo, INSPER and IBMEC. He earned an LLB from the Federal University of Parana and his master's from F FGV Direto Sao Paulo. Um, then we have Mateen Alakani, uh, who is an MBA candidate at the Yale School of Management. Before attending business school, he was a consultant at, Glo at the global consulting firm Compass Lex Lexicon, where he worked on litigation surrounding anti-competitive behavior and antitrust violations with a focus on digital platforms. Mateen completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Chicago, where he studied economics and statistics. So that's it for the esteemed panel. I guess we, let's, um, we're, we're going to start with Sean, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, great. Take it away, Sean. Sweet. So I, I included a baby with a phone because I figured that would evoke a visceral sort of reaction from everyone. So I hope that works. Okay, so uh, my background is in cybersecurity. Um, as they mentioned, I founded something here called Privacy Lab. Uh, I've been looking into, um, did I do that? Oh God, go back, okay. Um, I've been looking into um, proximity and location tracking for uh, approximately five years now. Um, it's an industry that has grown um, pretty substantially uh, over the course of the pandemic. Um, some of you familiar with uh, Bluetooth beacons in retail uh, behind, for example, end caps in grocery stores um, and, uh, you know, lighting and uh, shelving. Um, th this kind of technology is the saving grace, supposedly, of the brick and mortar industry. Um, it is the thing that is going to bring all of the benefits of online shopping um, to your local store. Um, and it is the thing that folks hope um, see, I never know when I'm too loud, problem. Um, it is the thing that folks hope will um, reinvigorate stores, especially with the challenges that they're facing in this pandemic, post-pandemic era. Um, I show these two examples here uh, just because things can be a little mo more unpredictable than I would know. Um, I'm not an expert in, in the area of food retail by any imagination. Um, I did work in quite a few grocery stores. <laughs> so and almost every department in them. So uh, anyway, um, this coin circulation challenge just shows the kind of thing that can hurt uh, small stores, um, you know, taking cash and so on and so forth. Um, and then we have the challenge from the big, you know, bully Amazon basically trying to uh, alter the way that we buy everything. Um, and they sort of have. Now to continue the pile on for a stop and shop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, also known as as giant in in other parts of the country, um, and I've worked in the stop and shop as well. Um, so Marty here is like one of my most hated things about stop and shop. Um, 
And uh, Marty's job ostensibly, stated purpose, is to uh, detect uh, spills so that uh, cleanup can be done. The robot does not actually do anything about the spills except sort of stop in the middle of the aisle, um, you know, blocking these already very congested aisles we have with all these displays in them and, and uh, shining a, blinking a light and alerting someone to come clean, clean the uh, aisle. Um, but this article and, and other articles talking about it, astute folks just paying attention to what the robot actually does, um, it follows you around basically spying on you as you move through the store. Um, so this is very uh, evocative, normalizing of surveillance. So this is continuing my theme of trying to evoke reaction out of you. Um, here's another one. So um, that's very visible surveillance sort of normalized uh, in our grocery settings. Um, but we have these things, which is primarily what I'm interested in here. Um, these are, of course, uh, little tiny beacons, uh, this one being a Bluetooth beacon. Um, they get this small now, um, and they are capable of uh, communicating at least uh, basic things like proximity to the sensor and uh, the location of the sensor, which for one device is not very useful necessarily, but in aggregate, especially as these things start being put in strips, for example, in shelving and on floors and in ceilings, um, it starts to become the thing that follows you around the store worse than Marty. Okay, so this is an example of typical location and proximity tracking. Um, this uh, really active on the left, this product is the one that I'm primarily looking at right now. Um, they have been successful at uh, doing Bluetooth proximity tracking of folks, uh, their cell phones, their smartwatches, um, any digital devices that they happen to have on them, which are broadcasting via Bluetooth. Um, in the pandemic era, of course, we have all been encouraged to have Bluetooth on at all times for um, COVID tracking. Um, and uh, we also have usually just kind of leave Bluetooth on as well as Wi-Fi. Folks tend not to turn it off um, and retailers um, rely upon that to do this sort of proximity tracking. On the right-hand side, that's a slightly different example. Um, that's a municipal example of uh, Bluetooth tracking. In both of these settings, you'll notice that it's not just about um, being able to pinpoint where people are, how long they're dwelling, how long they might be staring at a product or, or staying in a certain area or what the foot traffic might be, um, but you also can start doing basic profiling. Um, and I'm gonna show you an actual live example of me doing this earlier today in this room at the end of the presentation. <laughs> Um, so um, here's an example of a dashboard, a typical dashboard. This is again for that product really active. Um, it shows uh, the flow be, uh, past certain points of interest in a retail environment. Um, this is an example of me monitoring Wi-Fi signals at Yale. Um, this is, I think, approximately a week ago. Um, I know that this is probably a lot of information to throw up on a screen at once. Um, but the point here being these are all uh, wireless routers on the right hand side. Um, besides this data, you can get polling data from wireless devices that people have and they broadcast their names many times just like these routers do. Or identifying information you'll see on the left hand side I blocked out the last few octets of those um, addresses, um, but the beginning part of the addresses stays pretty um, the same. Uh, this is one of the ways, for example, that retailers can find out that you have a Samsung device or an iPhone or, you know, an iPhone that's part of a batch of specific iPhones from a specific year from a specific uh, cell phone company um, with a specific cell phone plan. Um, you can do it just based upon those identifiers. And you'll see the power level here, uh, negative 80, negative 75, et cetera, et cetera. If you know where this beacon is, right, you can estimate um, the distance of someone's device, especially as they're moving, you get more and more data points for the power level changing as they're moving throughout a space. So you can start building maps of people's motions, basically. So if you have GPS and you know how much power a transmitter is emitting, right? We have to be reminded all the time, myself included, that these things are basically radios in our pockets that are sending um, signals out. Um, the strength of those signals can be used along with the identifiers alone um, to learn quite a bit of information about us and track us throughout a space, perhaps a city, perhaps multiple cities. And here's an, uh, another example in New Haven retail. Um, that's downtown by um, Temple and Crown. Um, 
as we uh, see retail gaining more and more information from these things, and this is something I've studied pretty extensively, um, we're also seeing more and more exotic um, types of tracking emerge. Um, that's becoming especially true as privacy controls come into smartphones. So this past year, both uh, Google Android and Apple iOS have instituted um, some level of network protection for um, trackers inside of apps um, leaking data through the network pipe. Um, this example is actually um, ultrasonic or near ultrasonic uh, tones uh, that are used in a retail setting. You have an app, your app gives you coupons, right? It also happens to open up the microphone. In the store, there's an ultrasonic sound. Um, that sound is going through the overhead speakers, for example, like these tones at the top here in the green. They're very mechanical looking compared to the normal ambient sound down here. Um, those tones can transmit information from a speaker, let's say a smart television, um, to your phone, and you can do vice versa. Right? Your phone can talk to a microphone in, for example, an Alexa device, uh, Echo, a Nest thermostat on the wall, which Google, oops, accidentally kept the microphone on for a while. Um, <laughs> there's also these kinds of schemes coming in. Um, you call them schemes, that's biased. Um, these kinds of plans. Um, <laughs> Uh, frameworks, whatever. Um, this is an example of the ambient light sensor in your phone being able to give information um, through from overhead LED lighting. Basically, these lights blink faster than the human eye can detect with your ambient light sensor of your cell phone laying on the table while you're trying on your shoes in the footlocker um, can uh, speak to that uh, to that device. Basically, the same way that you would transmit bits using light over fiber optic cable, you're doing it in a ambient space. So how do we study these things? Um, well, we have to look at the software primarily, right? It's very difficult to study these things um, in the actual space, although I'm trying um, and have done in a few cases, but it's a good way to get kicked out of the store to bring something like this in and, and hang out. Um, I, <laughs> I also, by the way, am very interested in um, smart sinks and smart displays that are coming into bathrooms, but bringing this into a bathroom is also not the greatest <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> anyway, long story short, um, this is an example of a call graph. I've done these call graphs now and have some preliminary data from a number of uh, retail grocery store apps, including Stop and Shop. Um, and uh, this example actually is a little prettier than the examples I have prepared so far for uh, grocery retail, but I use it because it has the same um, tracker that I find in um, quite a few of these uh, grocery retail apps. That's Apps Flyer. This example is actually from the app that Steve Bannon has for his social network Getter, <laughs> which I also did an analysis of. So if you would like to know basically, um, you know, what the privacy level of these grocery store apps is, um, it's approximately as good as Steve Bannon's social network. So um, not very good. Um, now these uh, tracker SDKs, this is another notorious example I use for visceral effect, um, but we are starting to see these in grocery retail apps as well. Um, just like we have data sharing agreements um, elsewhere in many industries, um, we have data sharing agreements between these tracker apps and the companies that collect sensor information. Um, this example is a cluster of apps around something called X mode, which was specifically targeting um, Muslim prayer apps and LGBTQ dating apps. Um, so pretty atrocious stuff from my perspective to go after people uh, of those demographics. Um, that kind of thing, um, as far as I know, I cannot yet prove is happening in grocery retail, um, but I suspect it is happening at some level, most likely um, probably based on income level, demographic, uh, inner city, suburb, etc. So what are the takeaways here? Well, um, reliance upon online shopping, right, uh, coupled with all of what we've gone through with the pandemics, for better or for worse, um, that's put renewed emphasis on this sort of proximity and location tracking. This Bluetooth technology, primarily, but also Wi-Fi, also near ultrasonic and some of the other more um, exotic things. Um, they are everywhere in our grocery retail environments, other retail environments where people buy food as well. Um, these beacons, uh, <laughs> basically, I guess the thing I would say about them is that um, they're not, the bad news is that they're not that different than elsewhere in other industries. 
The bad news is that they're not that different than elsewhere in other industries, <laughs> okay? Um, so the privacy level I've seen so far, um, looking specifically at grocery apps is not good. Um, I am starting to also gather data in parking lots of grocery stores hanging out in my car like a creep. So <laughs> you'll see that maybe someday. And I swear, I hope I don't scare you. Um, <laughs> Um, whether or not you think that um, iOS and Android are, um, you know, uh, instituting appropriate controls at the endpoints, at the devices in our pockets, um, from talking to these types of beacons or for sending information over the network pipe, um, we still are, um, you know, whether they're good enough or not, I would say they're probably not, um, but some people would say they're great. Um, they do represent an increased awareness. Um, so something I'm very interested in, of course, is making everyone aware that these technologies exist, that they're really important, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, as uh, there's more consumer awareness and there's more controls put in place, of course, we're going to see more and more of these uh, ad tech companies and data brokers um, start to go dark, so to speak, and try more and more exotic ways of getting information um, to them from you. Um, so, you know, I know one of the goals of this conference is to put together a policy paper. Um, I have not done that. I'm very interested in trying to think about policy in an antitrust uh, context uh, from privacy harms, talking about antitrust harms. I think there's a lot of broad overlap there. Partially the overlap is in the difficulty of proving privacy harm and the high bar that is set there. Um, it's not dissimilar to what I think is the high bar that's set in um, antitrust situations. Um, anti-competitive situations as well. Um, so uh, any feedback on that would be great. And then just broadly, I think we should be talking about this more in the academic literature in general. I think the first few papers on this sort of thing, talking about it in the food retail context are going to have to set the stage just saying, hey, it exists and here's what it's doing. Um, and then we can probably more broadly talk about the impacts on certain communities, um, individuals, perhaps even, et cetera. Um, okay, now, I, uh, some of you may have seen me fiddling with this thing earlier today around, around 10 a.m. if you've been here since then. Um, I did actually collect data on you all. Um, <laughs> and I just want to prove that I can do this, I guess. Um, but it, also, that's not that difficult to do. So I've got my uh, laptop here with a nice touch screen. You'll see the graduate um, uh, hotel lobby, guest networks, etc. Below that, below that, there's about two dozen different uh, identifiers with um, Timestamps. I took out some of the columns here to not be sharing any private information, um, but you'll see the power levels, for example, so that I could potentially map from my location where I was sitting and figure out, you know, who was sitting where at that time. If I wanted to, I could have sat here the entire conference, built a map of people's movements. Um, many of the devices were also broadcasting, for example, Sean's iPhone or whatever. Um, so I didn't collect that data and show it on the screen, but I could have. Um, <laughs> so that's something to think about. Thank you. All right, I think you two are up. Let's hold questions till the end. Questions again? Let us hold them till the end for both, right. for both of you. Hey, uh, I'm glad I'm not on mute um, after two years. So um, thank you, um, Austin, Professor. Uh, Scott Morton for um, organizing, also David and Steven for helping with the audio. Um, so uh, Martin and I wrote a paper on data collection for retailing markets. Uh, our main subject is Amazon Go. Um, and our, I think our idea to write this paper was as we uh, started to see that Amazon was trying to leverage its online position into an offline market and gathering data um, in the same way they used to be, they, they do online and trying to do that offline. And we believe that a supermarket is a place that you you believe that you're not being surveilled, uh, but now you are by Amazon Go. Um, so we believe that Amazon is uh, seeking this kind of paradoxical goal um, from going online to, to offline. And that's, that's what uh, brought us to um, write the paper. Um, our um, Martin was going to uh, talk about what is the technology and why it does matter, and then I'll 
I'll talk about some uh, proposal solutions at the end. But just to start, um, Amazon is collecting much more data than any other um, supermarket has done so far. But not only that, Amazon has the power to process the data. Um, and uh, a few years ago, supermarkets, grocery retailers had the power to, or ability to collect data on consumers, but they couldn't process the data. And Amazon now can do that in many more um, data points than other uh, retail stores. So um, Amazon Go is seeking to expand the news, this new frontier of um, surveillance capitalism. We um, draw a lot on the literature by um, Professor Shushan Zuboff on how Amazon is um, expanding from uh, online to offline. Okay, so as Sean briefly touched on, Amazon is looking to change how you shop. And this is done through the Amazon Go stores, which use just walkout technology. And so they use much of the infrastructure you're seeing on this slide. And one way to think about it might be if you would imagine that our conference organizer, Austin, decided he wanted to learn more about his attendees. And so he installed just walkout technology with the lunch spread. And so he would scan all of our palms as we walk out to, to get our lunches. He would have installed overhead cameras that would have followed us throughout the process. He would have weight se sensors on each item that would have tracked when it's picked up when it, or when it's put back. And he would have given us each a basket or a cart that had cameras within it. And this would have tracked what we put into our cart and what we remove. And what we see is this is creating many of the same data streams that were present in e-commerce. And so as we browse, as we add items to our cart and as we purchase them, those decisions are tracked in real time and are used to target us. So Austin could have seen that Bruno got two sparkling waters and have chastised him later or have seen me stand in front of bags of chips for like 45 seconds and get a salad and could have known how to get me to come to future conferences. So where are we seeing just walkout technology and it's proliferating beyond food retail and we're seeing this as a software service that's licensed out and we're seeing it anywhere where there are basically short transactions involving easily managed homogenous goods. So looking at travel, we're seeing um, like within airports or within entertainment and stadiums. And this is largely kind of been the vanguard of what's been happening. And so you can go to these stores today, they're present and they're not just Amazon stores. And then we're kind of seeing this nascent spread in traditional retail. So looking at Starbucks as kind of the vanguard of this announced in November, as well as internationally with Sainsbury's and other grocer primarily in the UK. So why does this matter? So this replicates the implicit transaction that e-commerce presented to the consumer. And so whereas Amazon.com allowed you or I to shop online in exchange for this data, and this is an implicit transaction that we've has been discussed often, and it's not clear that this is of true value, like pure value to the consumer in exchange for this data. But we're seeing this same transaction in kind of the tangible world in the grocery store in exchange for foregoing the checkout line. So you're seeing three to five minutes of convenience in exchange for the same data streams that once gave access to the digital world. And so this is like a very significantly lopsided transaction and presents a lot of issues for consumer welfare as well as potential to discriminate on prices to consumers within the grocery store. Absolutely. So um, before going to the proposed solutions, just to touch a bit on uh, what Martini was saying, uh, the main difference from what from the technology that Amazon employs right now is this ability to uh, facial recognition. So Amazon can create a profile of the consumer not only on your uh, um, prime number but um, on your face. And more more than that, Amazon can uh, read your emotions when you're standing in front of an aisle, uh, and can also um, read like thousands of data points from your uh, expressions, your facial expressions. Um, so as Martini was saying, Amazon could would know that Martini was uh, decided whether or not to have the chips and then go to the salad. Um, so what the difference here is that a few years ago, supermarkets, grocery stores knew what the consumer of the customers were buying. Amazon knows what the customers are not buying. So if you if you go twice to an Amazon going store and then um, to twice uh, Martini decides not to get the chips, maybe the third trip to Amazon Go, he will receive a personalized offer to a bag of chips for half of the price. Because uh, Amazon know you are not you're deciding and not buying that. It's the same idea uh, when you're 
uh, shop on Amazon.com, you put an item on your cart, and then you delete it, and then you get an email saying, oh, you put it on your cart, and then removed. Try again, something like that. So that's, they're trying to replicate the online experience to the, to the offline experience. Uh, also, um, an, an advantage that this technology has for Amazon is that it's very passive. It's completely passive. It's not like um, you have to sign up for a loyalty program at the Stop and Shop or um, Safeway and activate a coupon on your app. Um, it's, uh, it's passive. You're just walking down the aisle and Amazon is collecting data on you um, as you as you go by. Um, this is not new. Um, so there has been uh, um, trouble with facial recognition uh, technologies in other countries. I can speak for my home country of Brazil. We had a the problem there with uh, the the subway in Sao Paulo, um, some billboards inside the subway had uh, hidden cameras that were capturing how people would react to the advertisement. Um, and that was uh, struck by the courts. So the courts based on our general data protection law said it was illegal, you cannot do, you cannot do that. So I think the idea is that um, Amazon is, uh, knows how valuable this technology are and is um, leveraging its position from the online shopping to the, to the offline world. So we going to the proposed solutions. Um, we believe there should be a concerted action between privacy and uh, antitrust. Um, first, uh, Congress passed a broad privacy protection law, which the United States does not have a federal um, privacy protection law. We had the California law that was uh, spoken about um, in the last panel. I think Colorado and Virginia also have state laws. Um, the problem, uh, the the effect of that is that uh, many companies try to follow the GDPR. So we have this Brussels effect, um, and that creates a lot of asymmetries of information between companies and um, enforcement because companies um, who are not from one of the states who have privacy protection laws uh, don't know what to follow, and consumers also don't know if they, are, um, um, they, if they can rely on, on those laws. Uh, right now, in Congress, there is a, um, a proposal um, in the House, it's called the Information Transparency and Personal Data Control Act. Uh, it was proposed by Senator um, uh, Congresswoman from, I forgot her name, sorry, Congresswoman Susan Delbeni from um, Washington. And the, it's a very inter interesting starting point for uh, the, the discussion on a broader um, action by, by Congress. On the antitrust side, uh, the FTC Act, I think was spoken about here uh, as well. Um, gives this broader, this broad action for the FTC to prevent unfair or deceptive acts of practice in or affecting commerce. And we believe uh, just so-called technology is deceptive. So that would fall within the um, FTC Act. And when, I talk, when we talk about like a concerted action between privacy and antitrust, it's very clear um, if you look at the, 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 the proposed act, uh, one of the sections um, explicitly say that a violation of this act or regulation promulgated in this act shall be treated as a violation of the Federal Trade Commission Act regarding unfair or deceptive acts or practice. So um, it seems to us that um, Congress is acting, um, calling the, the FTC to promulgate new, new regulations. But even if that the, the new law takes a while to, to be approved, uh, we believe FTC could act either under the um, competition lens or the consumer protection lens, seeking new tiers of harm related to, to data collection and, and privacy collection, um, privacy protection, how that affects um, co competitive dynamics and also um, consumer protection. Thank you.